Today we'll be reading, first of all, John 20, 24 through 29, Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and I put a finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not yet seen me and yet have come to believe. Next is Luke 24, 36 through 49. Jesus appears to his disciples. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and took it and ate it to their presence, in their presence, rather. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. May God bless these words to our understanding. What do you do when you're asked to believe the unbelievable? Both our stories come from that first week after Easter. Our Luke story is either the evening of Easter day or the next day, depending on how fast you think the travelers to Emmaus got to Emmaus and back, because that's what happens immediately before this. Two travelers are on a road and they meet somebody and they travel along, and only when they come to a meal and he breaks bread do they re recognize who it is that's walking with them. And they run back to Jerusalem with this great news. And they get there, and people are saying, yes, he's alive. He's, a, he's appeared to Simon. And then suddenly Jesus appears in their midst. The John story takes place about a week later. And I've always felt sorry for Thomas because Thomas gets a raw deal in the tradition. Thomas 
has been known for centuries as Doubting Thomas. Now, I don't think it's fair. First, because I've also heard Thomas described as the patron saint of the person who missed church the day that really exciting thing happened. What Thomas asks for is what everybody else has already gotten. Proof. He just happened to miss it. Some people have suggested it's because he was the only one courageous enough to not be in the room, to not be huddling in the room and out doing an errand of some sort. But what he asks for is what everybody else gets. Proof. I won't believe unless I see for myself. And when he sees, he confesses, my Lord and my God. What do we do when we're asked to believe the unbelievable? For those first disciples on Easter Day and in that week, those weeks following, they hear these stories. In Luke's gospel, on the story of Easter morning, when Mary comes back from the tomb and tells them what, they, what has happened, they believe it's an idle tale. Nobody believes in those Easter stories in the four Gospels. Nobody believes until they see for themselves. Poor Thomas. He's the only one that gets called a doubter. What does it take to believe? Many of us struggle with these stories of Easter. We can understand resurrection as a mystical experience. We can understand resurrection as something beyond our understanding. But we have all these stories about a body. Because both John and Luke, in their telling of these stories, make it very clear this is not a vision. I mean, Luke says, they thought they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus says, no, touch me. I'll eat something. Ghosts don't eat. There's something about bodies that brings that reality. It's, I think it's a challenge because after the Gospels, most people's experience of the risen Christ is more in the mystical, visionary understanding. From Paul onwards, At the heart of our story is this very real body. It's not a dream. It's not a ghost. It's a body that eats. It's a body you can touch. And obviously that's important to those first writers. And I think we have to continue to ask, why is that important? In the Apostles' Creed, there's a line about the bodily resurrection. and I know of more than one person who, when they grew up saying the Apostles' Creed, would suddenly lose their voice at certain points in it because they just couldn't say that. But what does it mean to say that the body is there? I think it, fart, it first says bodies are holy. Bodies are important. It's not like we're a disembodied soul. There's a strand in Christian tradition which says body bad, soul good. Earthly bad, heavenly good. The God who at the beginning of our story looks at creation and says, behold it is very good. Never says earthly bad, heavenly good. And so I think it's important to say that Jesus is risen in body because the body is still good. It's important to say Jesus is risen in body because that shows us that there's continuity between the man, Jesus of Nazareth, who walked and taught and preached and healed and invited people into community, and the risen Christ who continues to teach and heal and invite us into community. 
Bodies are important. We aren't just souls temporarily abiding in this body, but when we're, we're, we're all in one. We're body and soul. Bodies matter. The other reason I think this story, these appearance stories are important is that it's not a glorified, wonderful, healed, heavenly, glowing body in these stories. In some of the Easter, the Easter morning stories, it appears to be, the stories aren't always consistent. But in these stories, it's a body who is still wounded. Put your hands in the holes, Jesus says. We're not sure that, we're not told that Thomas actually does it. But I mean, Thomas has said, unless I can touch those wounds, I won't believe. We're not told when he's given the chance if he actually does it. Sometimes seeing is just as important as, as actually touching. The risen Christ is the wounded Christ. The risen Christ is the broken Christ. The new life of Easter comes through and with the brokenness of the world. All of us are products of our woundedness. All of us carry with us the scars of our lives. Hopefully we carry the learnings that go with those scars, but that's not always a guarantee. But we all carry the scars. And if bodies are important, if our lives are important, the wounds are also important. The scars are important. They're part of who we are. The risen Christ is the wounded Christ. Appearance stories are a challenge for many of us. Because our, lo our, our logical mind says, well, that can't happen. Our logical mind says, bodies don't do that. Mystical understandings of resurrection are much easier for some of us to, to understand. Visions. I think Christianity is at its heart a mystery faith, a mystical faith looking beyond those things that we can touch and see. The resurrection stories are a challenge for me and for many others. What do we do with this body is a challenge. But every year when I read those parts of the story, I'm reminded that the body is important. It's not some just a, some mystical thing. It's not something just in a spiritual plane. It's real. It's tangible. The body is important. Jesus, at the end of the story with Thomas, says, how blessed are those who will believe and never see. From a mystical point of view, you would say many people see in different ways. We are the inheritors of Thomas. We are the heirs of Peter. We are the heirs of those people who had that chance to see the risen Christ in person, who were given the invitation to touch and eat with. We believe because they believed. We believe because they passed on the stories. Not directly to us. There's been a few intermediaries in the 2,000 years in between. But we believe because they believe. We believe because they had the experience and passed it on to us. We believe that bodies are important because we believe in the God who said, this is good about creation. We believe wounds are important because we know that the wounded Christ is the risen Christ. We believe wounds are important because we know that the wounds show us something about the world. May God help us in our doubts. I've never believed doubt was an enemy of faith. I believe doubt is part of how faith grows. By asking questions. 
if I didn't believe in asking questions, I'm in the totally wrong denomination. Because you'll never find a united church where people aren't asking questions and challenging ideas. May God help us to grow with our doubts, to grow with our questions, to see the world as God sees it. Blessed, holy, broken, renewed, all at once. Because in there, when we see that, we see the reality that God is active in the world. We see the reality of God's vision growing in our midst. Amen.